Hello everyone, I am Rajesh Shisan Gupta and we are continuing our discussion on the colonial uh, interventions in the Indian subcontinent and their impact on the visual culture. So today uh, or this week, in the week 9, we will be talking about this so called new colonial media and uh, as part of that we, can, we will be discussing uh, the, the painting uh, media. So, for example, we'll be talking about the watercolor, the British watercolor, and then we'll also talk about the oil colors. So, uh, uh, we will be uh, touching upon similar themes that we have already looked into in the earlier week. And for example, when we spoke about printmaking and then why those were uh, not only just important for uh, making the, um, you know, uh, for the documentation, but also how that was also important for um, the administrative work, also for building a knowledge repository for the colonial uh, rulers. And then also that I mean how the indigenous people, the people in India, they have interpreted that and they have embraced it and uh, made it as a part of their own expressions. So the interaction between this, uh, the colonial media and the vernacular culture. So those things will also be touching upon uh, in this week as well. Now the thing is that I mean we will be looking into uh, uh, you know the, the painting media this this week. So in in terms of like the new colonial media, we will be talking about as I have said that uh, the the British watercolor. Now one might ask that I mean why British watercolor is different from the kind of watercolor we have already seen because we have already seen a number of watercolor practices where the pigment is. Uh, binded with some uh, blue and then like I mean water is added to it and then that was painted onto the paper surface and uh, or like I mean you know similar kind of mineral based uh, colors those were applied onto wall surface for making murals. So if those are the things that we have seen already in India then uh, or in the Indian subcontinent then why do I say that I mean this is a new material for uh, doing the works. So in terms of British watercolor, we are talking about the watercolor which are manufactured in factories and that is the reason we also find this fresh hues, those will start coming up in the market which kind of hues were not really available earlier. And then this range of colors that we also see uh, which, which were uh, coming from the British factories and those were not necessarily uh, used in the gouache technique or the tempera technique which were already been prevalent in the Indian subcontinent. So in Indian subcontinent the kind of watercolor we have seen those are mostly the opaque watercolor. So that means that I mean that is already it is a bit thick and it already has some kind of lime or other binders in it and that is the reason it is not translucent or transparent. Now the British watercolor for its um, you know so they are not bind with uh, this, this, this lime like um, additives and then that is the reason we find that I mean the transparent patches of the watercolor those are applied onto the paper that makes a very different kind of um, visual presence as compared to the kind of the opaque watercolor that we have seen in the Indian context. Now also we see this British watercolor, the colors are um, you know applied with the brush in very thin patches and that is how we find that I mean the, the transparency of the, of the color and then like I mean uh, the, the surface of the paper, all those things can be seen in this painted papers. So those are the reasons we find the visual presence as well as this technical uh, issues are, are different when compared to the opaque watercolor practices in the Indian subcontinent. And that is the reason we include that as part of discussing the new uh, colonial media. So here we have one of the example on screen and this is a black stork in a landscape 
and it was made around 1780 so the end of uh, 18th century so this in this images what we find that i mean one can still argue that i mean the kind of uh, the mughal documentation that we have seen that they had the documentation or the um, the representation of of different kind of flora and fauna which also appears here so, for example, this black stork is there, but the thing is there are also some of the striking differences one can see. So, of course, there is a stress on the this minute details of the stork. So, each and every feather and then all the curves of the body and then all the different kind of features. So, for example, how the feathers are different from the uh, from the beak of the of the stork and of course, like I mean, um, you know, the eyes, the, the other part of the body, everything else. So, how all of those things are, um, you know, done with utmost care so that all the differences in the physiological um, uh, aspects are, are, are revealed in these images. So, those things are certainly there and then we also see that I mean what kind of landscape is used here. So, again there is this low horizon line something that we have already discussed that I mean uh, the, the line of horizon is pretty low in this images keeping rest of the uh, area in this image empty. So, that gives an empty and almost like a uh, which, which was considered as a neutral space, nothing is neutral, but neutral space. So, that I mean one can see all the physiological features of uh, whatever uh, flora or fauna is there for uh, the viewers to see. So, for that reason they needed this kind of a neutral, uh, you know, they preferred this kind of a so called neutral background. And then in this the lower a register of this image we find there is a suggestion of a landscape and the landscape here we find that it is a perhaps it is a flood plain. There is little bit of suggestion of a, a slightly like a hilly or a plateau like land and then the rest of the land is plain with shrubs and occasional trees in the background. And then in the land we also find there is a river which, which flows in the right corner of this image and the, the meandering path of the river suggests that I mean this is a land which is on the plain. This is one of the characters of the rivers that flows through the plain land that I mean we see all the curbs and this meandering path which does not happen in the hilly landscape. So, this is also a suggestion perhaps to tell the viewers that what kind of landscape are there associated with this uh, with the black black stalk or like I mean what kind of places where these black stalks inhabit in the Indian subcontinent. So, these are some of the ways in which we find that there are this minimal use of landscape for uh, suggesting more more and more information about the main uh, object or main uh, you know creature of, of interest in these images. So, this kind of images we find to be uh, prominently made during this time period. Now, these images we also find that I mean they are called as the company paintings and company painting is a term that is used for um, understanding some of this um, you know like I mean some of this nuances of this new kind of practice in which what we find that when there are the travelers, the, the government officials, the, the ambassadors, the um, I mean we are talking about mostly of the who, who are associated with the British East India Company and, uh, and the other European this this organizations. So, we find that I mean when they uh, are in uh, the Indian subcontinent and they want to have some kind of souvenir or they want to uh, start making this uh, knowledge repository for for uh, you know for for having uh, a large scale documentation of the flora, fauna and different kind of um, architecture and other sites from the Indian subcontinent. So, they employed a number of painters or the drawers and who would work for this East India companies and that is the reason these paintings came to be known as the company paintings. Now, 
we also find that i mean in this this time that i mean of course that it came into prominence in the 18th century and then it continued until some part of 19th century before the advent of um, the photographs and of course that i mean we we also see that when the drawings were transformed into prints then making this paints i mean putting the paints taken um, um, effort in in making all these images also became less so that is how we find that i mean between 18th and 19th century only this company paintings have flourished and then um, you know slowly died out so this is this is something we find in this uh, there and uh, when we talk about the company paintings so art historian marika sardar uh, she she points out this issue that how um, company painting is something that is that is not there all across the indian subcontinent but only in few pockets so for example we see the important uh, the colonial cities for example we have spoken about this coastal cities which came into prominence during the colonial period so for example bombay madras calcutta and so on so in those cases we find that how those places uh, where uh, there is a strong uh, presence of the british uh, east india company so in those places we find how this uh, company paintings have also flourished so for example calcutta patna in in bihar and then tanjavur or tanjore these are some of the places where we find mysore of course where we find that i mean this this company paintings or like i mean this so called new paintings they have emerged and flourished now sardar also argues that how this kind of painting uh, practices were not there in the places like the punjab hills like the the areas where we have a number of the miniature schools and then also nizams hyderabad so the sites which were uh, or like i mean the areas which were under the rule of the princely states so they had very different kind of approach in painting during the same time when uh, this company paintings were uh, you know uh, developing in this newly found cities or or some of the other cities so these are some of the differences we can find that this is not really um, you know a widespread a uh, movement or not really like a widespread practice all across the indian subcontinent but it is something for us to think that how um, certain areas and certain kind of patronage that have been crucial for the emergence and a sustainment of this company painting so from there if we see some of the characteristic features of what this company paintings are or like i mean what kind of approaches they have taken so this is one of the example and this comes from bengal so this is this image shows like two sides of a bengal river fish so um, the uh, in this particular image what we find and this this one was made in 1804 that means the very early decade of 19th century so in this image what we have there is this uh, there is no other background or anything like the one we have seen here and here all we see is the um, you know like the two sides of this uh, this this river fish and this two sides are done with almost this scientific precision that uh, the the front side and the back side and with in in this one we see all the details of the 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 scales of the fish the fish skin and then all the other body parts and so everything is recognizable and they are done in such a way that this can be studied by the people whoever are looking at this images so they can be studied for understanding the physiological features how that is similar or different to the other um, you know fish or the other animals people study so those are the kind of issues we find in this images that how um, you know uh, that uh, they, they provide the both sides of this fish or like i mean any of the images it's almost like i mean uh, the stage where uh, you will be where one uh, 
you know indulge into uh, more and more like in depth study of the of the flora and fauna so then during this time we find like a similar kind of um, approach we can also find in botany where the dissection and the cross sections those those ones will be studied from the the, the stem of the plant the flower the fruit and everything else so here we find like i mean it's not a cross section but i mean it is um, the entire fish and how those those are also sort of like i mean uh, you know they respond to that kind of scientific study so uh, here the removal of the background also suggest that how the object that we see here is the foremost important thing and that's the reason there is no need for uh, showing it in any other background. So uh, the removal of the background also suggests that its closeness to this kind of the scientific study. So today we understand these images as art objects, but perhaps the reason for which they were created, we can see the removal of the background also attest to its uh, importance as a in the field of documentation, archiving as well as for the scientific study of them. So these are the ways in which we find that you, this is uh, also a departure from the earlier uh, approaches in uh, the watercolor painting in the Indian subcontinent that uh, even though during the Mughal time period we find that there are those minute uh, studies of the plants and, and, the, and the animals and birds and so on. But this right now like I mean during, during the 18th and 19th century under the colonial rule what we find is that I mean there is this new kind of study in which to uh, understand these physiological features of them and sometimes getting into the uh, you know uh, getting beyond the skin so understand the skeletal structure and then like the details of the skin and then the veins and everything else. So this is a new kind of study of the nature that we find that that arrived with the uh, with the western european uh, people and uh, this this is something that that we also see that i mean how the the practice of painting also assist them to to uh, go with it so this uh, for for that reason these paintings as i have already mentioned that today we understand them as part of uh, the art making process in, in 18th and 19th century, but we can see that, that I mean how these paintings were somewhat in between uh, art which, which, is, which is appreciated for its visual, for its aesthetic value, but also for its scientific value, that I mean how these images can be studied by the people who are perhaps not present in Bengal to see them first hand, but somewhere else and they, they can interpret and they can uh, you know have more like a comprehensive knowledge about the about the fish and the different kind of animals from this part of the indian subcontinent so similarly the company paintings we find that i mean they are not just restricted in terms of uh, their their thematics but they they had uh, a wide range of issues to address. Now, we, what we find there that I mean those, those uh, light patches of the watercolor, they are used and then very careful minute brush strokes of different degree, those were employed for making the, uh, you know, the, the objects or the sites. Uh, but the thing is that I mean we also find that I mean there are no uh, bright colors as like I mean the ones we have seen in some of the um, you know some of the miniature paintings for example like the ones from Basholi, from Mewar and from Deccan and so on. So here we find much more subdued pastel like colors, somber tones. So those are the ones we find there and that is also something we can associate with the so called British taste. And um, those are the ones we find that also being evident in this in this images. So as I have said that I mean in many of these sites like I mean in in uh, in Calcutta, in Patna, in Tanjore, and so it it might also be possible in Delhi. So in these places, what we find that I mean perhaps there were some of the uh, the painters 
who were trained in the royal courts or their ancestors were trained in the royal courts for uh, making miniature paintings. So they are, we find that I mean some of those painters, some of those artists would be employed by the, um, the, by the, by the East India Company for executing these images. And that is the reason the kind of precision, the eye for detail and then like I mean the strong linearity, those things something that we have studied in the, in the miniature paintings are still present here. But then what we have is that this um, you know they also have this strong orientation towards geometry and then of course this this color palette that I have already mentioned. So those things and then the perspectival view, the single point perspectival view which is also something that we see that being celebrated in Western Europe. So some of these conventions, some of these uh, intricacies of making these images would be different from what we have studied in the miniature paintings. So in a way uh, we find that these company paintings also are very hybrid in nature where different kind of this um, uh, you know the art styles, different kind of style of making these images, different kind of material knowledge they are all coming together to give um, you know life to this to this images. Now coming back to the content what we see in this particular image. So this is the interior of a hammam or like the bath in the in the red fort in Delhi. So what we see here is that I mean there is the depiction of this Mughal era architecture. I mean the hammam was built by uh, Mughal emperor Shah Jahan. So what we have here is this, uh, this uh, you know, the interior of this place where there are, um, um, and of course that I mean one can see that I mean it, it, the the perspectival view is very different from what we have studied in the miniature paintings. If in the miniature paintings we have multiple perspectival views, some can be from the single point perspective but then there are also like the bird's eye or the aerial view or there are like I mean many different kinds of this, this layered perspective they are used in the single picture plane for conveying certain ideas. Here what we have is that I mean as if the artist is standing right at this point and then the artist is observing everything from this point. So whatever we see here, we are almost seeing it through the eyes of the artist. It is a very different kind of approach from the miniature paintings. So what is happening in this case is that I mean this is also something we find in the Renaissance paintings and the paintings those are done in Western Europe later on where the, the, the subject position of the artist is uh, imposed onto the, the paintings by uh, putting the, this single point perspectival view and so the, this is the position of the artist through which the viewers also see the image. The viewers do not have like multiple perspectives to, to encounter the image or see it differently. Now what else we find in this image is all the details that, that has been done and um, perhaps like I mean the most important part we find here is this the tiled floor and all the details of the tiles and then like I mean the at the center the way we have like I mean you know this the centerpiece uh, all are made in marble and then, then the inlay work. So something that is also celebrated for um, the, the Shah Jahan's time period. So these are some of the things we find and as we have already studied this, this marble inlay work or Pachin Kari in, in Taj Mahal or in uh, the, the tomb of Itimadud Dola. So similar kind of uh, you know this, this uh, the, the floor decoration or this marble inlay work we find it here as well. Now what else become different here is this, this is not just an interior but this is also an interior which is furnished according to the English test. So what does that mean? So that means that I mean during the end of 18th century in the 19th century apparently many of these Mughal buildings or the Sultanate buildings in Delhi and some of the other cities they were rented or sold or given to the British resident to stay 
and that is how we find that perhaps this is this is also the hammam either it was inhabited by british officials or uh, it it is a kind of a a visual reconstruction of how it would look like if this is transformed into a, a habitable space and that is that is according to the british taste so what we find here is that there is a minimal use of furniture so here we find there is a wooden piano and then here um, the, the, there is a bench that we find and apart from this bench and this wooden piano perhaps there is this small it's a a table like uh, a small table like form we also find it here and then in this niche in this here we have like i mean a number of bottles perhaps the bottles made of glass and porcelain so it's uh, a display of different bottles here so apart from this bottles the piano and this bench we do not really see any other furniture in in inside this place and we know that i mean how this how this this minimalistic approach to emphasize the the serenity in this in this interior at the same time to celebrate the the existing uh, the the marble inlay work as well as like i mean you know the, the ceiling and everything so how how to enhance the beauty of this this places according to the british taste so that is something we find it here now if we compare it with like i mean the kind of images or perhaps like i mean the interior scenes we find in the mughal miniatures so that will be very different here and uh, you know uh, the uh, the kind of interior scenes we find those will be uh, shown with people there and and different kind of activities and here all we see is uh, this this deep silence or this serenity so something we find that how uh, this this aesthetic choice those are made and then this transforming this existing uh, architecture into something that is uh, you know like i mean the, that is then uh, taken over by the british that that marks a new era and that is also something that that's a, this even though this is just a visual but this visual has the power to talk about the uh, the political situation during this time period that how the the land of the indian subcontinent which already has its history now that is being transformed according to the british taste so this is this is some of the ways in which we can see that that there are those deeper meanings in this company paintings and why they have much value for historians for all of us today to to uh, you know for us to understand the uh, situation the socio political cultural situation in the late 18th and 19th century we'll continue on this theme in the next lecture thank you